give the disclaimer first. <coughs> Some of the information in this presentation may contain projections or other forward-looking statements regarding future events or the future financial performance of industrial memetics, including statements related to growth in business and revenues. We wish to caution you that these statements are only predictions and that the actual event results may differ materially. We would refer you to the documents that industrial memetics files from time to time with the Securities and Exchange Commission, but we're not a publicly traded company, so you'll just have to take our word for it. <laughs> these documents, if they existed, would contain and identify important factors that, that could cause the actual events or results to differ materially from those contained in our projections or forward-looking statements, including, among others, industrial memetics recent shift in strategic focus to online nation building, security research, and information warfare. Industrial memetics and ability to successfully build new web properties. Industrial memetics and ability to greatly expand its existing user base. The operational challenges of developing, deploying, and delivering industrial memetics services in a relatively new and evolving market with uncertain prospects for growth. Competition from new and existing competitors. Industrial memetics and ability to manage rapid growth in operations and personnel. The inability to raise capital for the future. The risk of not being able to obtain adequate connectivity from third-party providers. The political, legal, and economic climate in the United States of America, which is volatile, uncertain, and subject to change. Underdeveloped communications and internet infrastructure, currency fluctuations, and the inability to provide new internet tools and deliver services when requested by our customers. All right, that's the disclaimer. All right. Uh, uh, that, yeah, well, we, Tom will certainly be talking about that. All right. I am uh, Nick LeVay, or as many of you know me, Rattle. This is Decius. Uh, as many of you know, I'm Tom Cross. Uh, okay, I got that backwards. We are with Industrial Memetics. Um, our uh, areas of focus are broken down into two main categories, which uh, these days I'm calling online nation building, uh, which is mostly focused around the development and operations of the meme streams community and um, doing social network and community research so we can figure out how to build better platforms and tools for those things to exist. And freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of knowledge. I will be invoking John Locke many times over the course of this talk. And on the other side, security research. We need to know how shit breaks and what to do about it. Um, what is defined as shit can be a lot of things. Um, the other is advancement of clue and protection of the masses. Uh, that's a lot what this con is about. Uh, we're trying to advance our clue as a group and share as much of it as possible. And uh, I really hope at heart uh, everybody's main interest is protection of people. Um, leaving that vague is probably the best way it can be left. And weapons and defense research. Let me go into that one. Uh, one of the things that we are most concerned about is um, manipulation of things that people use to form their opinions. Uh, as we're moving into this new age where the, uh, uh, the web is becoming more social and it's about the people using it and how we're communicating and sharing ideas, uh, since it's all driven by people, it can be manipulated by people. And when opinion leaders are going out to form their opinions that they're going to share, the first thing everybody does is research. Sits down, reads what everybody has had to say about a given topic. If that stuff's manipulated, the entire chain becomes manipulated. It's a dangerous thing. That's what we're interested in. We need to understand these, and we need to be really good at that. And what that is, from what I see it, is when we see somebody manipulating a source that people are basing opinions on, we need to be able to point our finger at it and go, that's being manipulated, this is how, this is what you need to know about it. Um, the site we operate, as I said, is Meme Streams. Um, you can't really read this here that well, unfortunately. Uh, we got two definitions, uh, meme and memetics. Uh, Richard Dawkins uh, came up with these terms, uh, or at least he came up with meme. I think memetics just evolved on top of that. And uh, a meme is basically um, a, uh, uh, an idea in its purest form. The, uh, uh, in particular, one that likes to replicate, one that likes to uh, uh, act like a parasite and make people propagate it. Uh, the best example of this that I've been able to come up with is a joke. When somebody tells you a good joke, and you enjoyed the joke, one of the things that you're most likely to do is to share that joke with another person. 
uh, you're going to tell your best friend, I heard this new joke. And every time it makes one of those humps, it evolves slightly. It changes. You, you make minor edits or add something to it to make it connect more to the person you're trying to spread it to. That is possibly the best example of a meme I've been able to come up with. And people ask me this all the time. What is a meme? And it's a hard question to answer. I hope that's one that, that hits. Um, the other thing that, uh, that the definition really includes is that memes are mutually supporting uh, in that similar memes come together to make a larger meme, a larger argument, a larger case. Um, ideally, these build up to the point where they become ideologies. Um, memetics is basically the study of, uh, of memes and how they propagate and how we share them. Um, and this is, uh, this is definitely a hacker culture thing, always has been, will be, will continue to be. Uh, the space that uh, this exists in is one of the most rapidly growing and changing spaces in internet development right now. Social web tools are the future of the internet. I'll be coming back to that. As an example, uh, here's just some of the companies, or not companies, sites, whatever. Some of them are companies involved in the space. Some bigger, some smaller. I mean, we got on the, uh, on the end of uh, services that are being offered, we got like Blogger and Blogspot and TypePat and LiveJournal. On the other end, we got the pure social networking sites, which are basically how you're, 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 who are your friends and who they're connected to. And we got the kind of infrastructure tools that people are using. There's a movable type, WordPress. Ning is a new platform. Manila is an older one, Slash, Slashdot. Uh, and then we got indexing engines and sharing tools. Delicious has become really popular. Dude, check this out. It is almost like a ripoff of what we're doing. Um, uh, Dig is very similar, but Dig's kind of like delicious. Uh, and then in pure indexers like Popdex and Blogdex and Blogs. Uh, and then reader tools like Rojo. And in the dead center, Craigslist, probably the prototyp prototype called that. The best example of an online community that's existed yet. I mean, Craigslist is great. It's got locality to it. It's basic. It's got a lot going on. So I put that one dead in the center there. And, you know, there are, are, are things that are similar to others that are focused a little bit more on some communities than others. Uh, so that, that kind of shows, and, and of course, search engine people. And I was talking about things that can be manipulated, and they're a really good example of one. Um, uh, this is, I guess you could say, um, the edge and the smaller people working on it. Uh, the key thing, Web 2.0, it's made of people. This was a recent conference that took place, um, but the Web 2.0 thing has uh, kind of evolved into a meme of itself, that that is the direction that we are going to be going with um, the development of Internet tools over the course of the next uh, five years, three years. It's already been going on. It's going to be continuing to go on. Um, Buzz shit. We know. But the point is valid. This is a skitter map. I'm sure you've seen these. The people are attempting to basically map the Internet. It's a hierarchical map, uh, uh, just like a network. Uh, highly interconnected at points, but it's a bunch of hierarchies that come together. This is what human social networks look like. Uh, big difference in the architecture. In this map, each one of the nodes is a, is a person and the lines represent the flow of information between the people, in, in particular, reputation. I'm going to come back to that. Um, I was talking about the, the history of the Internet in brief. Uh, from the beginning to 1995, it was like the primordial soup of, hack, of hacker dreams. Um, we're pretty much having to build everything that we, any, if we wanted to use something, we had to build it. And uh, this, th this age is um, where the giants did the work that we are building everything we're doing now on top of. As we move forward, we got into the dot-com age. Build it and they will come with money. Yeah, that was kind of true. Everybody came. They came with money. Not everybody got it. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it, it. It went hot in some ways and not hot in others. And the recent age we're in right now is pretty much everything that we built. We built on top of this. We built all this stuff. We got the consumers there. The Internet is mainstream. Use it. Mature it. Spread it. Push it. That's what's been going on. We've been basically maturing the stuff that we've been doing. Uh, uh, if you can think of this point where, like, maybe Google hit the scene, uh, all we've been doing is basically getting better at what we're doing. And now, on to the future. So bright, I gotta wear shades. Um, 
we're going to be talking about where it's going. Uh, there are major players. Here are the ones that I'd put in the, uh, the category of most likely to be having major influence on this whole Web 2.0 space. The numbers on the bottom of their market caps. Uh, that one's Microsoft, so it's actually probably closer to the 63 than the 263 for the MSN wing, but frankly, I didn't want to spend hours looking at their SEC statements to get an accurate figure. And who knows, I probably wouldn't be able to anyway. Um, Google being in the dead center, they are currently the name of God on the internet. Ask them a question, they'll give you an answer. may not be what you're looking for, but it's probably pretty good. And America Online, prototypical online community, uh, aptly named too, because they did get America Online. They sent everybody a CD, they said come, and they did. Uh, yeah, a lot more than just one. And eBay, eBay I put in this space too, uh, because they, they built the market. They built the first real uh, market of senses where people could actually trade and do things that are more similar to what they trade and do offline, online. Um, and they are also showing signs that they're looking a lot farther than just um, uh, people selling stuff online. Their recent acquisition of Skype uh, being a case example. PayPal. Uh, uh, more reinforces the point. They're building the market. 800-pound eh, gorilla. Yahoo's done a lot of uh, good. Of course, the, um, uh, uh, their recent actions in China, frankly, piss me off in terms of... Uh, there's, there's a lot to say there. I could do a whole talk on it, and we're, we're not going to go there right now. Who knows who this is? Nobody, does anybody know who this is? Okay, the correct answer is Rattle's arch nemesis. <laughs> Okay, this guy reaches, I think, 70% of all the people on planet Earth right now. Uh, how many people here know how many political elections uh, this man has basically had critical influence in? Does anybody know that figure? How many countries? Yeah. Well, I, I suggest reading up a little bit on this character. We still have barons in this world. Um, we do, and we probably always will. That's the biggest media baron. This guy has more power to influence people's opinions, thoughts, and the politics of several countries more than anybody else. Um, uh, yes, he does own MySpace right now. He also uh, you know, got started manipulating politics in Australia uh, when he uh, uh, basically uh, used his papers to get somebody elected, and then when that person didn't do what he wanted to or something. He had the same papers take him down and put another person in office. And then he went over to London, and uh, I believe he's also credited with putting Tony Blair in. And we know how Fox News has been with the current power structure. Now, I'm not saying, you know, there's all kinds of evil intent or something like that. I'm just saying people have that kind of power. What Rupert is looking at right now is this. Rupert is looking at everything I, uh, I had on the previous screen. The area that this guy's getting focused on now is the internet. Pay attention to it. Um, now, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum from Rupert Murdoch, we have this guy. Who's this guy with a really big nose? Yes. Most of um, the stuff that we hold to be holy as a nation started with this guy. Uh, the marketplace of ideas is a real critical idea that we have really built uh, everything on top of. It's the basis of our free expression rights. Uh, the fact that it exists and if it works, it's the basis of healthy economies. Um, the first barons were governmental in nature. Now they're transnational corporate. Modern warfare is going the same way. Al-Qaeda is a transnational corporate entity. They're not a nation state. That's the way this type of thing is going. This is something that we need to uphold. Um, one of the earlier speakers was uh, um, talking about the type of things that, that hackers should take as their personal responsibility, and that the preservation of life is one of them. Uh, you, you put that over the preservation of your business or the preservation of your, your, your personal fortune. Sounds familiar, or very familiar in terms of what this guy was saying and other people that uh, were following him and, and built their ideas on top of the memes that he dropped. Uh, in that uh, freedom and liberty is more important than your personal fortunes, your business, your job, your girlfriend, your wife. You gotta, you gotta uphold that. Because if that exists and it's a good environment, we get this, the meritocracy of ideas. 
Um, the key part being merit, the idea that the cream rises to the top or the scum or whatever, but that something that has merit is rising to the top. If we have this, this can happen. If we don't have this, our economies start crashing, our schools can't grow their knowledge base that they're teaching, uh, we're, we're screwed. Um, and this is very important to us and what we're doing because we believe that the, uh, the systems that we develop to communicate and work together as groups um, must uh, reinforce this whole philosophy. Um, On to communication architecture. I'm sure this is one that just about everybody around here has seen. Traditionally, there's two types. There's one-to-one -one and there's one-to-many. Um, what's happening in this room right now is one to many. I'm basically broadcasting out. Anybody can sit and say something to me, but it's still one to many in that context. Broadcast television, broadcast radio, anything that falls under that is that. One to one, a telephone conversation, a discussion uh, between two people over you know, a table. Um, and then there's many to many. Many to many, I put new, it's not new. Many to many is what happens whenever you have a group of people standing around having a conversation with each other and it's going in multiple directions. You can't really do it and scale the group out. If you have about three or four people sitting around having a conversation, no problem. You got six or seven people having a conversation, no problem as long as they hold the polite protocol. You have, what is it? Hey, everybody. I really, really hate to interrupt, but uh, we've had a couple of cars broken into in the parking lot. Now, here's the thing. We've gone through and looked at everybody we could find. Um, I got a Florida plate, Baker 871, Kilo, what's the E stand for? Anyway, KE, Echo. We have an Ohio plate, EL 96 NT. Those are the only, there's been three cars we found so far. Uh, one of them, uh, Actually, the door is half open or just, you know, cracked open. It's not all the way closed, but the radio is not missing. I don't know if there are any other articles missing. So uh, when you get a chance, you want to saunter out and check your vehicle and everything, make sure everything's cool. But uh, those are the only things that we've seen. Uh, those two vehicles, there's a third one in the parking lot that uh, uh, they're checking out now. So I'm just trying to get those people. If you're within earshot, uh, I'll be in the parking lot with Metro. And we'll try to get some filed. Thanks, no problem. Uh, I hope nobody's car here got broken into. I hope mine didn't get broken into. Um, anyway, many to many. Many to many only usually happens in small groups, traditionally. Does it only have to happen in small groups? No, that's where we get to this whole internet thing. Uh, one of the key uh, uh, parts of meme streams is the reputation system. I showed this uh, picture earlier uh, that this is a, a relatively accurate representation of what a human social network looks like. All the points are people and the lines are um, some piece of information that a person had that another person got from them and then in turn relayed on themselves. So basically it shows movement and the arrows point to the sources and that basically is reputation. Somebody gave you something that was relevant. It doesn't see good, it doesn't see bad, it only sees relevant and non-relevant. And if they got something relevant, it shows up in this map essentially. Um, and our system understands this. So when this person here says, give me information from people I get information from, or when, rather when this person shows up and says, hey, what's there? The system looks at it from their perspective into uh, the whole and aggregates information uh, based upon the people that they've gotten it from the most that they've passed it on. So it basically gives everybody a unique view based on their experiences in the system. This is how we scale many to many. This is how we make many to many go from five or six people sitting around having a conversation to several million people sitting around having thousands of conversations and the ability to interconnect them. This is the stuff we're going to see in the next few years. Or we've been, we're, or you can already see it now. In our system, the uh, bit of information that gets passed around, the meme, um, it's basically like a blog post. You got a title, and that's basically what the meme's known by. That's the type of thing that's going to uh, you're basically going to be querying on in search engines. Uh, your keywords, your subject, pick it carefully. Um, it, it helps it drastically. Um, 
what categories it falls under. Now, currently our system is using topics. We'll come back to that in the next slide. Uh, but, I, uh, but we're switching over to tags. It's about 40% of the way done, uh, timestamp. And um, now we have information that's basically quoted, a linked resource of some type. And uh, that could be um, any web page, a news article, um, uh, another post somebody made. And what you have to say about it, and basically that element, that usage of uh, language and communication, you can repeat any way you want. You might be saying, this is something that's quoted, this is what I have to say about it, this is something that somebody else had to say about it, and some response to it that's an addition to the argument being made. Um, and this can get passed around. And if you're seeing it in, your, in the uh, reputation agent, the portion of our site that, um, that actually uh, aggregates the information based on the social network, you're, you'll, you'll see who it came from. You know, it might be a friend, someone you work with, another person, another. You know, this might be your friend. This might be somebody you work with. This might be, be uh, some famous person or somebody who uh, 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 um, publishes a lot to people. You know, it may say CNN and... Uh, uh, um, uh, things like that, basically where it came from. And uh, links to resources, a thread. Every URL in meme streams has a thread. So posts that are unconnected, if they're linking the same resources, you can go in and see these are the things that are linking these resources. Similar to if you go to Google and search for a link, you'll get all the things that are linking to it. That's going on internally in our system as well. Um, recommend is basically passing it on. Uh, you're going to put it up on your page, your blog, um, and it will show up in other people's reputation agents and things like that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, reply, which is basically just replying back to the person. It's not going to be posted on your blog unless you specifically say post it on the blog. And that is basically what you're passing around. It'll wind up getting more complex. We don't right now have the ability to embed pictures, and that's because when we do that, we want to do it right. Um, and that's a theme that's uh, uh, running through some of the stuff I'll be talking about. Um, uh, say tagging versus topic hierarchies. You know, topic hierarchy is a hierarchy. This is an example of what somebody's per personal topic hierarchy might look like. You can't really see it, but we got society, sports, technology, economics, international relations, media, uh, politics and law, religion, football, football with two L's, golf, skateboarding, etc. And, you know, dividing it out, internet media, newspapers. It doesn't age well, doesn't scale well, and it becomes limited. Uh, you're, you're limiting the topic space people can talk in. Tagging is a better approach. It has the, that, that type of interconnected nature that we see in the Internet and things like that. It's the better approach. We're moving it to. It's also uh, uh, very open in that you can create any tag and say, this is the tag I'm applying to something. You can do searches on tags. You can aggregate on tags. You can get RSS feeds based upon tags off people's pages or the system as a whole. That should be in soon, but it, uh, it's not in now, and I hate to talk about things that we don't actually have yet, but it is kind of critical because we need feedback on some of this stuff. Like this. Um, another thing Meme Streams does not have is grouping architecture yet. Uh, we have not made public groups yet because we are confident that this is one thing that if we do not get right, we really drop the ball. Um, this is... Uh, um, an example of an architecture model for a group. This is kind of where we're at right now with uh, what we're going to implement. Um, uh, the, the pretty much this is like your group membership, group leaders. Leadership is basically determined by the reputation within the group. Basically, it would start off as the people who started the group. But as the group actually comes to life and people are using it, it's based upon the people that are contributing the most to the group, the stuff that the group most finds useful. They're automatically in that position. The leadership defines the canon and the interests of the group. Um, start with interests. The interests are simple. Tags. It's going to wind up being tags. Uh, and when people post things to the systems, if they have the tags that are in the interests of a group that they're a member of, that stuff filters into the group's, the group's meme pool. And there's a filter-up process that takes effect. As people 
and recommend those memes, those supporting memes, they rise higher up the filter process as they come down to the group output. Um, one of the things about a group is that if you have a static group, it's not a useful group. Uh, a good example of static groups are pretty much every single social networking site on the internet. A group is pretty much a list. When you sign up to a group, you get added to a list and it gives you a badge for your web page, essentially, and it might have a discussion board that may or may not being, be being used. The group doesn't have much of a process going on. It's not doing much. Uh, in this case, being a member of the group, what you're doing in the system, if it falls in the interests, is going to be brought into this process. Uh, the canon, and I've been trying to find a good word for this, uh, and I'm working with canon right now. Uh, but a canon is basically what the group is all about. You could have groups with similar interests that have completely different canons. Picture if the topics were healthcare related. All the tags had to do with healthcare. You could have one that's coming from a Democratic perspective and a Republican perspective and a Tennessee 10 care perspective. And all these different groups are going to have the same interests, but they're going to be coming from a radically different vector. They're going to have different memberships. So that's, that's going to figure in. When a group comes into existence, its leadership is going to define the canon. It's going to define the interests. That group is going to take on a life of its own. And then the leadership is going to be determined by the reputation within the group. And then we have the conflict element in that if an, uh, you get to vote with your reputation. It's like you get to vote with your dollars. Uh, you, you use them in the market and the economy to determine what things should basically make money. Uh, usually you have choice with products. Well, this is one of the points I haven't fully worked out yet. But group members can basically take their reputation and vote no confidence and basically subtract whatever reputation they have from the leadership's reputation and basically knock them down. The problem is, is that if you're trying to take out a leadership position so you can become one, once you go to make that no confidence vote, you go down to the bottom as well. Basically, you'd have to rally other people in the group to have a leadership change. A little bit like a revolutionary structure in that if you have uh, the leadership of the group for some reason is just the canon no longer is acceptable to the group as a whole and the other people at the top of the reputation uh, uh, distribution that should have control of the group if they can or feel they should have control of the group if they can motivate enough people in the group to give no confidence votes then they can knock that leadership out, and it becomes an organic group at that point. And that's something that no other system is even attempting to do. They're not attempting to come up with a group architecture that actually has life to it. And group metrics. Um, at the very least, head counts, an important one. Leadership and the membership. Uh, dead weight, people who are in the group but not actually participating in the group, that don't have anything to do with the group. They're just there, they're not contributing content, they're just there. Um, external readership, the key point here, who is reading this? How many people? Is this group's output important to folks? If it's, uh, like I used the healthcare example, we got like a 10 care group, how many people are reading the 10 care group? Uh, that's a, a, a key metric. And, you know, the idea that in the filter up process, there has to be a certain threshold before uh, um, uh, a meme or a collection of memes hits the group output versus just what's in the meme pool that the people in the group see. Um, influence distribution. Are we talking about a group that has like five or six people who post everything and a whole bunch of people who are really interested in what they post. Um, that would be a, 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 a distribution with all the, the, all the stuff going on in a leadership region. If it's one where it's just like people who like stupid stuff on the internet and all kinds of people are recommending stuff and all kinds of stuff is getting recommended all around, then it's going to have a very different influence distribution. Activity level, it's an obvious one. Uh, and growth and attrition, how much is the group growing? How many people are leaving the group? That's one thing that I want to make sure happens in this system. If, if, um, if the group isn't useful to be in, people should leave it, all right? We don't need dead weight, okay? If you're not interested in it and you're just keeping it in a list, 
this is what should happen, and this is what you should be paying attention to, not this. So that type of dynamic has to appear in the system for it to work. The, the whole theme here is we need groups that have life in them. They need to be organic. Everybody in the group has to be contributing to the group. Everybody in the group has to be getting something out of the group. The group actually has to create something that is useful to people that have nothing to do with the group. This is just as important as this. This is the product of all this. Being a part of this should be special. That, that, that canon should be something that means something to the group. Uh, it'd be like saying hackers and coming up with a definition of hackers that people can agree with. Um, that's basically where we're at right now. We want to implement this and see what happens, and it's not going to be an easy thing. Uh, at this point, um, I want to toss it over to Tom, who's going to speak a little bit about it. Another one of the most awesome resources on the internet, Wikipedia. Everybody here knows Wikipedia. I don't even have to ask. It's great. Everybody loves it. Um, reliability is an issue, and it's spoken about a lot and for very good reason. Since uh, one of the things that is key to what we are doing is coming up with ways to evaluate information sources, determine if they're trustable, um, things of that nature, it ties directly in to this. M Wikipedia is a perfect example of a many-to-many -many thing in action. It really is. A lot of people building a resource. So, Yeah, we want to take a lot of the thinking that we've been doing about how to build <coughs> collective uh, communication systems that produce useful output and hopefully apply them to other projects as well as our own. So um, before I explain uh, uh, what um, uh, me and a friend of mine have been doing with Wikipedia, I kind of want to talk about Wikipedia in general. Uh, when I was first presented with uh, Wikipedia, you know, my first thought was this thing is going to get spammed out and it's going to get trolled out and it's going to get kooked out. And uh, I basically uh, put it on a put on a Wikipedia death watch and, you know, figured I'd sit around and wait and see how long it took before someone stuck a fork in it. Uh, it's been going on for several years now, and I actually find it useful. Um, you know, uh, there are... So, uh, you know, I, uh, th there are a number of particular reasons why I find Wikipedia useful, and I've been trying to think about them, because there are certain things that Wikipedia is and certain things that it is not. And uh, there are reasons why it has been successful, despite the fact that uh, um, it's open to influence by a lot of crazy people. Uh, and so uh, people kind of try to expect Wikipedia to be an encyclopedia, and uh, it doesn't really fit the... Uh, the, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't meet the standard that you'd expect um, an encyclopedia to meet. And so people get really frustrated with that. And uh, they don't understand, you know, why, you know, they, they think if you can come up with a criticism of it that it's totally useless in any context. Uh, so where is Wikipedia useful? Wikipedia is useful uh, because it's at my fingertips and it's free. So if I want to know something about a subject really quickly, I can go check it out. Um, it's it's useful because it's timely. Uh, when something like the uh, terrorist bombings occurred in London uh, last summer, you know, you could go to Wikipedia that day and get a very matter-of-fact collection of data about what had gone on. Um, if you went to the news media, you get all these different stories, and you have to go to a lot of different resources to put together a picture. But you go there, and they've kind of aggregated. This community of people has aggregated all this data for you, and they put it in one place. And they tend to draw from a broad set of resources. Um, after the, uh, after the uh, bombings, the uh, British police shot some guy trying to get on a train, uh, and they, there was a lot of speculation, I remember, in the media about why the guy was suspicious. People said he was wearing a jacket, and it was a summer day. Um, I went to Wikipedia, and uh, somebody had put a link up there to a sort of farmer's almanac-style website that keeps historic weather data. And uh, they uh, had the temperature in London that day, which was about 61 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not a temperature which, uh, you know, it would seem weird to uh, imagine people wearing jackets. So, um, you know, the press doesn't seem to link stuff like that. They don't like linking, you know, weird websites that collect data like that. They don't link primary sources that often. And so that can be frustrating if you want to... Uh, if you want to uh, dig into to details. Um, at the same time, Wikipedia definitely has problems. Uh, when I was reading that story about the, uh, the, the bombing in London, uh, somebody put in a, can you hold on for one sec? 
can you guys not have this conversation right here? Thank you. Um, so, uh, the, um, you know, somebody put in that 10,000 people had died in London. And, you know, I knew that wasn't true. And I, uh, you know, I said, well, when did that come in? And I hit reload, and that piece of text was gone. Uh, so uh, an example of a place where I would not use Wikipedia is uh, if, if my boss asked me to uh, implement a cryptography algorithm. Uh, there's certainly a lot of cryptography information up in Wikipedia, but I, if I'm going to implement something like that, I have to have a very precise understanding of exactly how it's supposed to work. And so if somebody has come in recently and edited the page on MD5, for example, and made a little tweak, I'm not going to be able to see that you know, when I look at the information. And so I can't really rely on it. I'm going to go to a print source like Applied Cryptography, and I'm going to get the data from there. Uh, so... You know, what does, this, what does this observation say about where Wikipedia is useful? Um, it's, it's, it sort of fills this gap, I think, between the bleeding edge and the headlines and the kind of stuff that you can go to set in stone published print resources for. Um, you know, I'm going to get, you know, today's headlines from Google News, but if I want headlines from last week, it's a little bit more difficult. Sometimes the news sites don't make the stories available. They certainly don't have it organized on their main page. Maybe you can dig around and search engines and find it, but it's, you know, it's kind of hard to get access to. Um, at the same time, you know, getting highly reliable, you know, print resources with, you know, good editing and grammar and the like usually takes a long period of time. You have to pay people to compile those resources and publish them so, um, you know, there may be as much as a year's lag on that kind of information. Wikipedia sort of fills the gap between those two places. You can go and uh, get information about, say, the terrorist bombings uh, this summer. You can't get that out of Encyclopedia Britannica because they publish on an annualized basis. Um, and you can't really read about it in the newspaper anymore. So where are you going to go if you, if you need to understand it? This, this resource is useful in that respect. So... Um, in, in thinking about this, uh, you know, once we understand, and, and let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. One of the things, like I said earlier, people expect Wikipedia to be because of the way it's presented is an encyclopedia. And what people think about an encyclopedia is it's something for junior high school students who are writing reports to go learn about subjects, to have it, to be able to reference. And, um, you know, they're frustrated that they don't think Wikipedia is the kind of thing you want to show to an 11-year-old. And I kind of agree. It doesn't... It doesn't have good grammar. There are going to be inaccuracies, uh, inaccuracies in there, and most people don't know how to reference it properly. They'll reference a Wikipedia page instead of referencing a revision of a Wikipedia page. And so later on, if somebody wants to find out why they said something, uh, it's difficult for them to figure out if the page has completely changed, you know, where they got the piece of information they say they got. So it's not super reliable for that, uh, for that function. It's, it's reliable for other ones. And I think it's important that we understand that um, despite the fact that it's not really an encyclopedia, that it's useful for certain applications. And if we focus on those applications, we can make it better at the things for which it is well suited. Uh, so me and uh, my, my friend uh, James here were talking about uh, uh, Wikipedia, and we were, we were talking about my problem with the, uh, the 10,000 dead in, in London uh, comment getting added to uh, the page on the London bombings and a couple of related uh, sort of subjects. And, you know, we, we, we came up with a proposal for a way that you might change Wikipedia to make it easier to identify uh, those, kinds of, those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of problems. Um, and, and, and it relates to uh, something Joy Ito said. He's sort of a Japanese net luminary. Um, you know, a lot of people have been kind of scratching their heads about why this thing hasn't turned into a ridiculous sort of spam nightmare. And uh, one of the things he said is that in the model, uh, you know, text, you know, tends to be viewed by a lot of people. It tends to get edited a lot. And things which sort of survive a very broad peer review tend to be more reliable than things that have not survived that kind of peer review. And so that's why, you know, Wikipedia articles tend to have uh, reasonable content over time. Uh, and, but however, unfortunately, when I go to a Wikipedia page, I can't tell, you know, what's brand new that, you know, some idiot might have just added and what's been there for a long time that a lot of experts have looked at. So I want... Okay. Okay. Um, uh, did you say eventually the content gets locked? 
Some pages they will lock, but they try only to do that in context where there's conflict over that page, and they have a real problem with them. Um, they don't want to lock the pages in general. And there's a, there's a big question about that because they don't have a staff of experts at Wikipedia who are doing um, sort of auditing of pages. Uh, and, and so how do you decide when it's at a level where you can lock it? You've got to have someone who's an expert on the subject matter who can say, well, this, this, this text is accurate. And so it's going to become official now. And in order to do that, you have to pay them. And, you know, they have a cultural. I don't want to open this up for open discussion. Um, sorry, we're running short on time. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, they, th th there's a cultural thing in Wikipedia where the, some of the people operating it don't necessarily think that exports are very reliable and they want to sort of have a, a sort of public, you know, common man's knowledge perspective on information, and there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, but these are subjects I, 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 I haven't really delved into. Um, Jason Scott, who's, who's, who's here talking about his BBS documentary, has raised some really interesting uh, uh, commentary about the frustrations that subject matter experts have in trying to maintain Wikipedia pages and trying to improve the accuracy of the content there and the inefficiencies of an open editing process in terms of producing reliable documents. And uh, um, those are interesting criticisms. I find that the product is still useful to me uh, in spite of the fact that it might be a lot more human, there might be a lot more human cost in terms of producing it than there are for other things. Uh, and I, I think that those are good subjects for exploration, but I don't have a solution to that problem yet. I have a solution to a different problem. Um, this is uh, the Wikipedia page about Glenn Reynolds, who some of you may know him. He's a blogger from Knoxville. He runs this blog called Instapundent. Uh, which is quite popular. Uh, a friend of mine pointed this page out to me because, um, you know, it's got some information about him. He's a law professor at the University of Tennessee. He's widely known for his independent weblog. It also includes this, um, this is wrong order. Oh, whatever. Um, it also includes this comment. No, actually, it's not. It also includes this comment about how he likes to drink um, blended puppy energy drinks. Uh, he's a political pundit. He has enemies, and one of his enemies has, you know, decided to tell everyone that he likes to eat dog. And so, um, on a regular basis, someone will go into the Wikipedia entry on Glenn Reynolds and add a comment about how he likes to eat dog, and. Not a lot of people read this Wikipedia page, so this commentary about the dog tends to live up there for a while. Uh, and I, I kind of want to take a look at a couple revisions of this page and see, like, you know, how it reached this stage. So this is the page on Glenn Reynolds on, uh, I think it's February 27th, uh, 2005. And this is mostly factual information. Glenn Reynolds is blah, 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 blah. This is a reasonable article. On February 29th, uh, someone has come in and added some attribute his endurance to a unique diet of, whoa. Some attribute his endurance to a unique diet of blended puppy energy drinks, which allow him to successfully juggle his professional and blogging responsibilities. Okay, so let's go to the next page. On March 6th, somebody comes in here and he says, no, 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 he doesn't really drink puppy energy drinks, but his fans jokingly attribute his endurance to that and, uh, you know, wanted to break up Instapundent and Weblog into two links. Um, and then the next slide. Mm-mm. There was a March 14th slide. Well, whatever. No, actually, you know what? I think this is fine. Sorry. Um, at, at some point, the next person comes in. I, this is from March 14th. Uh, somebody came in and, uh, and, and said uh, uh, they were concerned about the, um, the, the idea that he was best known for his Instapundent weblog, and they changed this text to say he was most widely known for his Instapundent weblog. So... Somebody came in here and added this crap about puppy energy drinks, and it lived through three different edits for about half of a, about half of a month. It was the edit after this one where somebody finally came in and deleted this, this sentence. Uh, so it, it gives you an example of, of the kind of situation you'd like to avoid. Now, um, what we've done is, uh, is, is tried to find a way of, of displaying visually to you, you know, what edits have survived a lot of, um, or what content in the article survived a lot of editing over time, and what content is fairly new. Um, so this this is actually off my laptop, not next slide. Yet. Go back. Um, this this is off my laptop. Uh, it's um, it's uh, uh, th this is the um, this is the version from from March 14th, um, and I've added. There's usually these tabs up here at the top of the page. There's um, 
there's uh, uh, the article, the discussion, edit history. I've added this new tab called reliability. And uh, if you click on it, next slide, um, you'll see that, that we have the text colored here. Uh, and so we have three color phases. We have red, yellow, and green, which we think is a pretty reasonable way of communicating this. Um, and any text that's been, and I'll explain how this breaks down, but any text that's been edited within a particular period of time is colored. So um, all this content about puppy energy drinks is green because that was from the first edit. The second edit, uh, you know, he changed this to say his, his fans jokingly attribute his, his, uh, his, uh, his endurance to puppy energy drinks. That's yellow. And then uh, there's some red text here, most widely read. That was the last edit. So that's uh, the most recent content. Uh, and the, the way that this, um, this works uh, is dynamic. Uh, in Wikipedia, some pages are edited, you know, hundreds of times an hour when there's a really hot topic that people are, people are uh, constantly contributing to. And then pages like this may go for weeks without anyone touching them. So you, um, you, you need sort of a dynamic way of doing this. And what we do is we take a look at a number of edits and uh, we, we, we ask, you know, how long has it taken for 50 edits to occur to this page? Uh, if it's taken less than an hour, uh, and we're not gonna make this faster than an hour, uh, you, you, uh, you, you might see the first hour's content being green, second hour being red, uh, most recent hour being, or rather yellow, and most recent hour being red. Uh, whereas if you have a page where someone edits, edits the page, you know, once every two weeks, then maybe you'll see a month's worth of content being green, second month's worth of content being yellow, third month's worth of content being red, and we can just scale that dynamically. So um, the, the idea is that, you know, articles that are getting a lot of attention from a lot of people are going to become reliable more quickly because there's a lot more focus on them, whereas these articles that hardly anyone ever touches, they take a while to, uh, to, uh, to uh, solidify. And the, uh, the uh, I have uh, one more observation to make. Oh, well, if you wanted to, so the, the vulnerability here, I guess, is if, um, if I went to this Glenn Reynolds page and I added this puppy smoothie content to it, and I knew that no one, no one edited it for a long time, and so I knew that on the reliability page, my text was going to be colored for a while, then of course, I could go insert a bunch of bogus edits in order to make the system think that my edit frequency was really high so that the, uh, the coloring would change rapidly. And if you do that, of course, you're, there's this page in Wikipedia, which is recently edited pages, uh, edited pages, and the Wikipedia community kind of monitors that page for, uh, for changes. And so that page is going to suddenly show up a whole lot on the recently edited pages page. And so you're going to see that, somebody's going to see that and hopefully go in and notice that, uh, that you're trying to manipulate the system. So I think that this is, this is a solution that immediately shows you what text you can rely on definitely, which is this stuff down here and maybe this sentence here and shows you stuff that may be new, that may be less reliable. Really, and, and, uh, and it does it in a way that, that is dynamic and fairly secure. And so uh, one of the things, um, one of the things I think, you know, maybe it could be argued that this doesn't actually make Wikipedia more reliable, but it perhaps gives people a better feeling about the content that they're seeing when they use Wikipedia, and so that could help Wikipedia's uh, reputation as a useful resource, even if it, um, you know, regardless of the degree to which it actually improves its usability. Um, so anyway, that's that, and we have a, I'll uh, hand it back over to you for the, like, closing couple slides for our presentation. This is a perfect example of what I was saying earlier about uh, um, uh, industrial memetics weapons and defense concerns. This is a defense. It's an information warfare thing, not a bomb building thing. And uh, this is a perfectly good example of coming up with tools that are going to give people a way to see when these critical information resources are being manipulated or changed. Change, manipulation, all becomes different shades of the same color, I believe. Um, and back to just sum up a few more things about meme streams. Uh, other stuff that we can do that's on our roadmap, and we don't know exactly what mile marker it's going to be on the roadmap, but it's there. This one we actually have right now. Uh, you can search your own blog, your own stuff that you've submitted, your own personal search engine for the stuff that you wanted to make a note of. Um, and socialware search, search your friends, or just your friends, or just their friends, or, or maybe a group of people, and just say, I want to search these people. We already got that too. The only thing is it sucks the way it's implemented. It's just because the database structure is it's messed up right now. Uh, when tagging goes in, that's going to get a lot better. Archiving and caching of all linked pages. If somebody recommended something, it was relevant. 
If something is relevant, it should not be lost. It should become part of recorded history. I'll invoke Jason Scott again, since he's doing so much of that. I'll invoke Archive.org. Uh, there's a perfect example. That functionality um, needs to happen to everything that meme streams ever sees. And revision tracking of it, too. You know, I want to see how the pages change. The same way with the Wikipedia stuff. We need that for everything that we ever link that we find relevant. Um, I'd love to extend searching all link pages. Uh, so that that layer gets added to search because search is important. Remember, Google was at the center of the map of the billion dollar companies. There's a damn good reason for it. URL shortening and URL vetting. Billy's talk rocked. Uh, uh, there it is. His talk rocked because uh, um, tiny URL is something I've been bitching and complaining about for a while uh, because I see it as an accident waiting to happen, particularly in uh, usage for like uh, um, cross-site scripting. And that you did a damn good job. You did more than I was expecting you to. You did, you did way more than I was expecting you to do. That was awesome. Um, and uh, uh, the service is useful, the, the shortening down a URL. The only thing is I don't want something where I don't know what I'm going to before I'm going to it. I want a chance to see what that thing is or at least know that somebody thought it was safe. Since we're tracking reputation, we have a very easy way to do that. A, t a total reputation score that a URL has to have before you are relayed through to it without a warning. If somebody just posted up the URL and let's just say it was recommended by three people who just made their accounts yesterday, not going to hit that threshold. It's going to send you to a warning page, show you the URL, and at least say, you know, you're going through to a page that hasn't been vetted or something like that. Um, however, if it's been recommended by a few people who have a lot of reputation, they provided a lot of relevant content for people, you know they're a real source. They're not a spammer. They're not somebody trying to screw you over. Sure, I'll pass you right through. It's been vetted. That is a service. When you take that and this, and you add them together, you have the type of stuff that tiny URL should be doing and is not doing. It could be doing, um, but will never wind up doing. Uh, Internet-wide reputation system. Uh, the first time most people have heard the term reputation system is in terms of eBay, rating sellers, right? Well, we can apply that across the board. Um, one of the reasons that a lot of e-commerce happens in clusters is for that reason. You need to know sellers are reputable. That's why it ha uh, you have like tons of Yahoo stores and all kinds of commerce happens on it. eBay and all kinds of commerce happens on it. Um, we can use that kind of tracking element um, and apply it to Yahoo and to eBay and to the mom and pop internet stores. That same Walmart versus mom and pop thing exists on the internet. There's mom and pop e-commerce and then there's big e-commerce. We can level that. That's a tackleable problem. And um, email client is primary authoring platform. Uh, simply put, when you're composing blog posts and things like that, w messages to other people, um, what's the most advanced application on your computer for doing that? Your mail client. Uh, it's got all your nice inline spell check for people who don't have Macs and have it everywhere. But it's got all the nice inline spell checking. It's got your address book functions. It's got all kinds of stuff like that. That's the platform that I think we should be composing, you know, our meme image on. Uh, it's, it's designed for it. It's got folders. It's got all the stuff that you want already there. It's got things like IMAP that make implementing this type of thing relatively easy as compared to designing an application from the ground up. That's something that I want to tackle. Anybody who wants to get involved in that piece, that's something you come and talk to me about. Anybody who wants to get involved in that piece, that's something that you come and talk to me about. These are things that we're trying to build a team to do. Uh, that is the main focus of a lot of my work and Tom's work is trying to figure out how we build the team to build the thing. Building the thing itself is impossible for two people to do. We're doing a shitty job of it, and it's because we can't do all this stuff at once. We need to build the team. Um, and uh, that is not an easy thing. Uh, it does, uh, we are looking for investment. Um, <laughs> so uh, I we'll guess we're going to kick it. Way. We'll take anyone's money if you uh, have a, well, it's fair. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> before we open.
open it up to QA. I want to apologize personally for being extremely hungover and not perhaps presenting in, uh, in uh, top form. But, uh, yeah, same, same here. I was up till 5 last night. I stayed up way too late last night. Okay, um, questions? Oh, no, not, in, not with Meme Street. The no, question. No, 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 in Wikipedia. Oh, in Wikipedia, yeah. yes. Wikipedia. The question was if, if Wikipedia had a way to view revisions, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you be, I think the tab is even revisions. History yeah, history. And that's what it is. All right. In the back. What's that? Uh, the to do this, to do the reliability yeah. uh, I, I did some thinking and I didn't find, well, I mean, I'm, I'm of course interested to see. I did some digging around and I didn't find something like that. I went through their extensions list on their site. Um, so I, I don't know, whatever, I'm interested if you can provide me with some pointers. Sure. Oh, yeah. Waxy W is okay. Any any keywords for searching what they were calling the extension? That's cool. Well, it, you can have a private identity that, that is persistent, and then you can associate a reputation with that identity. And so one of the things that I, I think I, – I'm just trying to get past this into, into, uh, into talking about some of the problems that you talked about, but I, I, don't, I don't know um, – uh, uh, you know, I haven't – my ideas aren't totally – uh, gelled yet, but I was thinking that you know you uh, we have this time slice in, in this model where something is something is considered reliable because it's been around for a long time, um, and if you if you had people 
checking in edits who I guess had a strong reputation, then at the time when they edit the page, it could be considered reliable, and then you uh, and then you only color stuff after that time. So basically, they could push content toward um, greater reliability. And so one of the things you could do is break up. Um, you could have a beta page and a, and a live page, and the live page is the last reliable version of that page, and then the beta page contains newish edits. Uh, but um, are we getting kicked out? If anyone wants to do QA, we'll go outside back there, and, and um, we'll, we'll take any questions you have out there. Is that cool? Cool. All right. Thank Great. Thank you very much, everybody.